Right. Hey, thanks for your patience, everyone. Yeah, so hey, I'm I'm uh, Jamie Stutz with the New Zealand Antarctic Society Wellington branch. Uh, we're gonna bring a couple of couple of fresh faces up here for our second installment of um, Fresh Off the Ice. Um, we're already kind of already heading into winter, so usually this is done a little kind of you know closer to the uh, summer season. But um, we had such a such an exciting season last year that we thought maybe we'll. Uh, give it another go. So without further ado, uh, we've got four great talks on and uh, Graham's going to get us going here. All right, good evening, folks. So I think I need to share screen, right? Put yeah. people on the other end to see it. Um, that's me. That's about right. Yeah. Brilliant. Okay, so uh, my name is Graham Leonard. I uh, work on volcano and tsunami mapping and warnings research at GNS Science. A few of you. I see a few familiar names online as well. Hi, Fred. Um, I'm going to, Gary, Gary Wilson actually tagged me to come in and talk about uh, this of field work that I helped them out with over the last season. Uh, and I'm also at George's request going to talk a little bit about the other context that took me there in the first place, which is Mount Erebus. So I'll save plenty of time at the end for that. Uh, the project I was helping with, just as labor basically, this is my first time to Antarctica, so a very exciting trip down for me and especially to the dry valleys as a geologist, but a volcanic geologist, a place I wouldn't normally get to go. Uh, the Seneca project was about sources and impacts of greenhouse gases. And it's a collaboration between uh, Italian uh, program and New Zealand program. And they're looking to identify uh, current and I guess estimate future potential emissions of greenhouse gases from Antarctic permafrost using the dry valley as, as a, an analogy for the wider Antarctic uh, ground. And you can see the, one of the photos we took flying in, we, we caught, caught some quite heavy snow. We're just after some quite heavy snow, which is unusual there, I guess. Um, Soil gas and origin, um, carbon dioxide and methane, uh, geophysics is the main part I was involved with, which is about resistivity, and also uh, characterization of the soils. And they're really looking for seasonal trends of carbon dioxide and soil concentration. And here's Gary as I speak of them. Uh, so we were working in the Wright Valley and the Taylor Valley in the two yellow circle area areas. I won't go into the McMurdo detail because it's an audience that knows Antarctica pretty well. But the key thing is it's free of ice. Um, low annual precipitation really is, is the main driver there. The bottom right photo is one we took uh, where it did snow on us and we abandoned half of our field work and that snow had ablated within about two hours of taking that photo. Uh, there was still a pack in the middle, but all the dusting was gone. It's extremely cold and it can be very windy. So we were following on, it's a multi-year program and we were following on from a season 2019-20 where a bunch of the Italian team uh, connected, conducted soil and permafrost sampling, gas sampling, uh, and they put in long-term monitoring probes as well. You can see the photos for all of that. The point here was really to look at gas that might be coming from permafrost, but especially the unfrozen ground potentially below the permafrost and in the brine that might be down there. So this isn't really a, 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 the science talk. Gary would be giving that with the Italians. This is more my reflection on my um, exciting time down there. But I, I, I was lucky enough to join this further geophysical survey work in those two valleys. Uh, the previous survey had identified the, the green and uh, blue blobs there, which are methane, uh, carbon dioxide, and multi-gas anomalies. And the yellow line uh, being the transect we were trying to uh, run resistivity across to intersect those anomalies and try and work out what's going on. So it's really working on resistivity, but the Italians were regathering gas data and servicing their probes. Uh, there's our team, uh, Motley crew, uh, and you know, really lucky actually in my case, because of the COVID related restrictions, we had to look for domestic labor people like me. And I was working pretty heavily with Intact New Zealand already, which I'll mention at the end. So we had to fly in about half a ton of copper and uh, steel probes to jam into the ground. 
and one Gary Wilson in the top box there on the right. Uh, and this is one of our two camps. You can see kind of the scale of the valleys we were working across there. Camp at the left, there's some humans in there. And uh, come off that glass here just to the right. Uh, there's a close up of that campsite. What really struck me is I'm a geologist, volcanic geologist, but a geologist in general, and I do a lot of work on New Zealand geomorphology. And it was just so exciting to be able to be in a place with a different set of processes. So there's no, not really any water interaction. The small amount of water there, I've got a photo at the right. There is some daily melt at the, in, in season. Uh, there are some algal mats in the water there, uh, just um, by Richard's feet. Uh, but in general, it's dry, of course, dry valleys. It, it's full of ice and everything is wind driven or tectonic driven. The mountains are up and being glacially eroded. Uh, wind or tectonics or, or ice um, as the driving force themselves. And so the time scales for me were completely different. I'm used to assuming water erosion and even water mechanisms. Uh, the idea of you know ubiquitous ice raft of drop stones dropped over everything else, you know, things that look like moraines just happen to look like moraines. Uh, things that were probably aeolian dunes or, or lake terraces, they don't look anything like those, even though I look like at them in New Zealand. So I was just like a a kid back at university with Gary and the team again. And you know, being next to a glacier and having to chop off pieces to drink like in the top right was just an added bonus. Uh, the required photograph of a thousands of years old walk the wrong way seal. Uh, and just some of the other, some other photos there to illustrate, you know, that unusual freeze thaw action texture. Now those are those are blocks that have broken apart in the top right. This is those amazing vent effect structures as you fly in. Uh, you've got these uh, lake slash dune slash moraine interacting terraces around the edges of the valley. It's just incredible landscapes. And um, I just felt so lucky to be working on something new after having a substantial chunk of getting into a career in a different part of earth science and a different part of the world. Uh, scale was everything in this place. So there's people in that photo. You can see us stretched out along this orange uh, copper cable line. So we were basically uh, like a train uh, shuttling cables from the back to the front of a one kilometer line and working our way a few kilometers uh, across uh, one line in the Southern Valley and two lines in the Northern Valley and uh, electrocuting the ground to try and see what the structure is, what the electrical structure is. Those are the cables look like. Each one with the pack was about 26, 28 kilograms on the right. Often needed a person to help put it on your back. Two 500 meter to a kilometer lifts a day really put quite a bit on you and the rest of the time you were hammering in electrodes to the ground but it was totally worth it um, and we just had amazing weather we were able to deploy uh, most days over about three weeks in the field we only really lost a day and a half uh, you know and a, and a good um maybe maybe two days total including a day of rest time in there so we just went 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 uh, we rested in the field. We'd be running the experiments. Uh, there's Thomas, who was always the control guy in the middle of the train. And we had radios to make sure we didn't electrocute ourselves. Uh, and when we were clear of the line, we'd just lie down on the ground and follow Gary's lead to uh, catch rest where you could. It's a particularly comfortable way to be after carrying cables. Uh, we, those are the electrodes on the left. Sometimes we were putting them into loose sand more often than not. And we were trying to get them into the permafrost. Every now and then we'd hit a patch of that recently fallen snow and have to dig quite a cave to get into that. Uh, then we would run a test to see if the electrical line had conductivity back to the box. And then we'd have to go back and count uh, factors of six or nine out of 96 to work out which take out to add yet more electrodes with a mallet. I'm sure some of you have done this before. Meanwhile, the Italians were busy using their brand new jackhammer to collect more permafrost samples. So I, I, I hear a big improvement to the way they had it without a jackhammer on the previous trip. And in the evenings, one nice aspect was we had one of these um, beautiful Polar Haven tents, kept 10, 15 degrees, the diesel heater. Um, and we were able to, you know, compare all the different data sets uh, coming in live, process the data live, and you know, evaluate what we were getting and where we were going throughout the course of the work. Uh, and always under the supportive and watchful eye of Gary there on the right. So these are the last couple of slides. Uh, this is the type of results we're seeing: various levels of processing of resistivity data, creating a virtual set of intersecting points of electrode uh, and sensor 
take ups across that's more, more than a four kilometer line there. Reds resistive and the, the cool colors uh, are the more conductive and the, I'm not the person to be in, interpreting this. I was there as labor, but the, it was an interesting contrast between the two valleys, uh, right in Taylor Valley. So the, in the Southern Valley, you've got a, um, a, a, an already known brine layer deep down, presumably transporting, you've got those gas anomalies. Uh, this is data from that line. And what's interesting is the anomalies were kind of at the uh, northern and southern sides of the valley, right up against that high resistivity across uh, at the at either end. And here's a topographically corrected interpolated model early on from the field, right at the edges, you were getting those gas anomalies coming out. And Gary, I don't know if in the last few months, you've got any further interpretations you want to make on that. And this is in the Taylor Valley, uh, whereas the interesting contrast is in the right. I guess we, we found that it's a closed in basin and it's like you're probably still working out whether it's a tectonic close in or a geomorphic close in, but it doesn't have that brine flow. Okay, and I'll finish out with a few slides to talk about uh, why I got lucky uh, I, to go down and, and carry copper for this uh, expedition. Uh, I've been working for the last couple of years, uh, connected in again through Gary, with Antarctic New Zealand around Mount Erebus to understand the, the risk to Scott Base from ash, potentially field safety for um, activities on and near Erebus and flying around the bases, and potentially from monitoring the volcano as well. So the rebuild, uh, others worked on a seismic and a tsunami uh, risk assessment. And the, uh, one of the three teams I was kind of overseeing worked with me on a volcanic ash assessment. And, you know, there's a notable concentration of many, many layers of ash in the ice, uh, in the shallow ice around Erebus. So we know it produces ash eruptions, even though it's normally just got a lava lake putting out bubbling Strombolian type eruptions. We also know uh, that the generalized windrows goes in a lot of different directions. So it's not out of the question for that ash to blow. And Scott Base in isolation is a high importance level structure. So in New Zealand, we need to plan out for buildings like that for thousands of years because of um, the chance of people, the, the, the consequence of a bad um, occurrence happening. And ash can affect generators, anything that breathes air, the actual surface of um, buildings and equipment, and definitely air and air transport and vehicles. Um, and in terms of the actual volcano itself, this is uh, footage from Rick Astor, who we've been working with out of Colorado. This is the lava lake with a false color. It's not actually blue. Uh, and you see this Strombolian burst up at the top of Erebus. And these are blobs of magma flying up. And in a second, you'll see one of those blobs uh, narrowly avoiding taking out the camera. So it's, it, it's burst, there's a blob on the way. You can't even see it coming yet. And then boom, that blob that just flew by, past is probably about that big. And so we're in New Zealand and now also in Antarctica trying to work out how to quantify and, and kind of manage that risk up on the volcano too, which is actually where my expertise and my team's expertise lies. And it, it's about understanding this timeline as well. You know, there, there's been good research uh, heavily involving the, the US over, over decades. There's been a, uh, an Erebus um, volcano observatory, uh, maybe not quite the way we would run one previously until about 20, the last 10 years. And you can see there have been bursts of more activity of, of uh, explosions, like these, uh, these bars show a number of explosions down in the crater and their bomb distributions. You know, these are out to 500 to a kilometer distributions from the inner crater bomb distributions that have been mapped up there. So it's not, it's highly time varying. And the problem is we have no data coming off the mountain real time at the moment. So I've been spending a lot of time trying to work between about a dozen agencies in New Zealand and the US to look at how NSF, who are going to leave probably five instruments, the red five instruments on that map, in up there, seismic, uh, GPS, and probably blast detectors, uh, and think about how we might be able to run real-time monitoring across those agencies. Uh, USGS is very keen to do that in a joint way. We work with them to learn about monitoring as um, colleagues already. We'll probably be out of Alaska, and we have to work out things like how we manage the difference between our uh, volcanic activity bulletins and alert levels compared to the US, they're completely different, uh, but servicing air traffic and bases that sit right next to each other. So it would be a whole new joint venture. And the last slide, um, 
Really, next question, what else for field work? Well, there are, and Gary really pointed this out, there are earthquakes down there, potential for landslides. Uh, both of those could lead to potential for local source tsunami, especially on the sea ice. So there are other dynamic risks that aren't volcanic that might be worth thinking about down there too. Thank you very much. Any questions for Graham? Anybody? Anybody online? Thanks, man. No worries. Fantastic. Did you get your hands on the jackhammer? I did. Yeah. 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 Good fun. Yeah. It is good fun. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. What a varied experience. I mean, that. Uh, yeah, that sounds really lovely. Any any queries? Anybody? Yeah. All good. And uh, I guess uh, next up on our list is uh, we'll go a bit to the south. We'll we'll follow um, Jenny Black and see what see what she's got for us uh, down at Discovery Deep. Kira Koto, hopefully you can hear me okay. Cool. I'm just gonna um, share my screen. Okay, can you see that okay? Yep, all good. Cool, so I'm gonna talk about um, the geophysics survey I was lucky enough to be part of at Discovery Deep this summer. Um, you can see here, this is a team of five of us, five person team that were out there, led by Andrew Gorman from the University of Otago, along with Hamish and Will, also from Otago, Matt Tankersley, who many of you probably know from VUW, and myself from GNS Science. I'm a data technician in the geospatial data analysis team at GNS, and this was my second trip to Antarctica. So I'll start with um, telling you where Discovery Deep is for anyone who doesn't know. It's out on the Ross Ice Shelf, the other side of Minna Bluff to Scott Base. So when we were looking north, we could see Minna Bluff, which if you're at Scott Base, that's what you can see if you look south. And if we looked in the other direction, we could see the huge expanse of the Ross Ice Shelf. So all of my maps are going to be um, this way up with the South Pole up towards the top of the screen and New Zealand down towards the bottom of the screen. So the colours on this map are the GNS bathymetry model, with blues being deepest bathymetry, up through yellows and reds to white being the shallowest. Um, other models are all slightly different, but they all seem to show that there's a considerably deeper region here at Discovery Deep than anywhere else under the ice shelf. So that's the area we went out to. If we zoom in there quite a lot and have a look at what information, what data was already known before we went out there this summer. Again, I've got the bathymetry underneath, but this time in grayscale, so we can see everything else on top. Zoomed in quite a lot. The black is the deepest area, um, coming up to whites being shallower. And the bathymetry model, the GNS bathymetry model at least, is a inversion of the Rosetta airborne gravity data, which are the colored lines here. Um, the Rosetta data was collected a few years ago now. And this gravity data shows low gravity, where you might expect the deeper bathymetry perhaps in blue, rising up to the yellows and reds in the higher gravity. And then the coloured dots on here are the ice shelf surveys that have been carried out. And there's two of those in that area. There was the Discovery Deep Traverse in the 1960s, which did a big traverse all the way across Discovery Deep and further. They took readings at quite a few places, but these are the only ones where they actually got a depth to the seabed. And then the green dots are the rig survey from the 1970s. And again, that's showing the depths to the seabed. So you can see that these points are really quite sparse. They're closest together at 10 kilometers, but much larger gaps in other areas. But showing that there's a deep area around here that extends to some extent, not very well constrained. The yellow box here is our polygon of safety. This is the area that had been assessed by Antarctica New Zealand, demonstrated to be safe, no crevasses. We were free to roam around and do our science. And because we th thought that probably the deeper area was likely to be out here, we focused our efforts towards the northwest part of our polygon of safety. So our goals for the summer were to learn more about Discovery Deep. I mean, not just because it's fun and exciting to learn more stuff, but 
hoping to evaluate as a site for future drilling. The idea being that if there's a deep basin here, it's probably filled with sediments. Perhaps there'll be a lot of recent sediments, which would be useful for Gavin's program and other science. But obviously you wouldn't just go and drill somewhere. You'd want to collect as much data as possible before making that commitment. And then our kind of secondary goals were hoping to ground truth the Rosetta data and get some more control points for the Ross Ice Shelf bathymetry model, which will particularly help Matt with his PhD, who's working on a model of the, bathym the bathymetry model of the Ross Ice Shelf at the moment. So we hope to do this by primarily collecting a 30 kilometre long seismic transect across the ice, orientated hoping to cross the maximum depth area and avoid potential shear zones. And then we also wanted to collect some gravity data and then test out using a streamer seismic system rather than the more traditional system that New Zealand's generally been using on the ice shelf. So our primary goal, I guess, primary objective was the seismic transect. That took the majority of our time. And we did this in a similar way that some of you may be familiar with, may have seen other talks I've been involved with, the same way that Andrew Gorman, Hugh Horgan and other people have collected it, at the CAM ice stream and other places. So we started by burying our um, Pentax charges 25 meters deep into the snow, which meant we had to drill holes 25 meters deep. We used Darcy's hot water drill for that, which was coaxed along by Hamish and Matt. We worried a few times whether it was actually gonna last till the end, but it did successfully drill our 120 holes. We were able to get all of our shots in. But it's quite a labor intensive process. Not only do you have to keep the hot water drill going, but there's a lot of digging snow, melting it, to generate enough hot water to bury all the charges. So it took about two weeks to get our 120 shots successfully buried. And once we worked all the way along the line doing that, we could then go back to the start of the line and start actually collecting data. So we would start, say the first shot, we dug in our 96 geophones, all buried maybe 50, 60 centimetres deep, deep enough to have a good pack of snow on top of them to buffer them from any noise from the surface to ensure the data was as high quality as possible. So these, um, yeah, every 10 metres with the shot in the middle um, would let the first shot off. Then we would dig up the first 24 geophones, unplug them from the cables, move the cables along to the front of the line, dig the geophones back in, plug everything back in, let off the next shot. So a really fun process, collecting data all the time, but really quite a labor intensive way of collecting seismic data. So this took us about another two weeks to shoot the data. So best part of a month to the actual four weeks of actually out in the field of some bad weather days as well. So it's probably slightly over a month in total to get our 30 kilometer long line. But our reward for that um, month worth of effort was this beautiful seismic line. So this um, goes from the west to the east. If you remember from the earlier figure, we thought it was probably going to be deeper towards the northwest of our polygon, and that does seem to be the case here. So this seismic line, as is commonly the case with seismic, we've got quite a lot of vertical exaggeration here. So we've got 30 kilometers along here, and this is currently in time down the side, but the ice at the top, this white bit's about 450 meters thick. Then we've got a large amount of seawater getting down to the um, seabed around 1400 meters deep and then the sediments below that. I'll zoom into the sediments in a minute and see that we can see there's um, various multiples as we go down which are just essentially re reverberations through the ice. So if we zoom into the sediments at the bottom still with an exaggerated vertical scale slightly more exaggerated got our 30 kilometers along there we can see our seabed rising up here from the west to the east. And that's about 200 metres of sediments there. You'll notice that there's a kind of double reflection for the seafloor and a double reflection for the multiple. That's the ghost of the seafloor because we buried our shots 25 metres deep. The energy goes down, but there's also more energy that goes up and then comes back down again. So you get a repeated um, reflector for any reflector that's there. So it will, everything comes in pairs. Um, we can start to see there's some sediments in here. Um, you might find it a little bit hard to see on the screen. So I'll turn on um, Andrew Gorman's interpretation. So we can see how we've interpreted the sedimentary structure there. 
So the good news is it does look like the sediments there. The bad news is if you're wanting to drill into really recent sediments, is these are probably not that young, that old enough to have been quite deformed. Um, and I guess the other good news is it does fit our expectations. It is deep off to this side and it's rising up to there. Whether we've hit the deepest point or not, whether this is rising up to start coming up again, or if it's just a blip like there's other blips along the line, it's hard to know. So it was our major data collection. We also collected gravity data in the area. That we did that with um, GNS Science's Lacoste Romberger D meter, which you can see I'm using here on the ice shelf. We collected gravity data along our profile. The profile we collected seismic data on, which you can probably just make out, is the black line along here. Because it's a bit quicker to collect gravity data than seismic data, we were able to continue the profile a bit further to the east. And we also collected a grid of data up near our camp profile coming out and a couple of Dagmar profiles, which were done at the angle to be vertically underneath um, some of the Rosetta airborne lines. So we can do a little bit of a comparison with that. So if we look at the, um, well, to say, sorry, there's no key on this. So, um, blue is the lower gravity readings. So where you might think everything's deeper or lower density, so either deeper sea floor more sediments, deeper basement, and red is higher gravity, so C4 like to be shallower or the basement higher. So we'll zoom in to the profile, take a look in a bit more detail, but it is looking like everything's deeper out here where we kind of expected it rising a little bit up here and then particularly rising up towards the um, eastern end. So if we look at the profile. This is the same seismic profile we're looking at before, our 30 kilometer long line with some vertical exaggeration there. And if we plot the um, gravity there, we can see it's not exactly mimicking the seabed. The gravity is really quite deep there and then rises really quite rapidly over about um, 10, 20 kilometers here, which is somewhat different to what we're seeing in the seismic, which suggests that perhaps what's happening in the basement deeper down than the seismic can see is a little bit different than what's happening with the bathymetry. So that's one of the things Will's going to be modeling as part of his masters. And I think this really shows that having not just seismic or not just gravity, having both together is a much more powerful data set for finding out what's actually happening under the ice. Okay, and the third um, data set we collected was with the seismic streamer. As I mentioned before, we collected our long 30 kilometer long seismic line, which took the best part of a month to collect. It was quite labor intensive. A lot of gear needed to be sent out, a lot of fuel and so on. We trialed using a seismic streamer, which is a much quicker, easier method, but we wanted to compare it with what we knew was good, what other people have used here. So we did a three kilometer profile with the streamer in the middle of our main profile so we could compare in the same region. So you can see here, Andrew is plugging in one of the geophones. This just happened once. You just plug all 96 geophones in at the beginning, attached to the streamer, which you can um, see coming out the back of the skidoo here. Once they're plugged in, they're plugged in. You just tow them along the surface, stop for each shot, move it along, next shot, move it along, next shot. And the geophones just sit on the um, ice, so much less effort to collect. And then we didn't have a hot water, we didn't use the hot water drill for this. We weren't burying our shots. We used um, 10 meters of deck cord just placed on the surface, which you can see here, just sits there on the surface. So much quicker, much easier, but that's only useful if the data is as good quality or just as usable. So the good news is it looks like it probably is. And this is something Will's going to be really looking at as part of his master's. Um, but just as a kind of preview now, on the left, we've got this three kilometer long section with the streamer and the surface shots. And on the right, I've just clipped out the same section from the long profile that we did with the buried shots and buried geophones. So you can see they're fairly similar. There's nothing radically different with either, but there are a few differences. With the streamer, it's about three times faster to collect. And that's with three or four people rather than five people much less gear needing to be taken out, maintained, looked after, less fuel, you're not running the whole water drill. And then when you actually look at the data itself, you can see there's no ghost because the shots on the surface, there's no extra 
path for that. There's lower frequency content, but that doesn't seem to affect, at least for our preliminary looking at it, what you can actually see in terms of interpretation. But because everything's on the surface, it's potentially more susceptible to noise from wind, for example. So maybe you'd only be able to collect it in better weather. And both methods are limited to only the top 200 meters or so of sediment. And that's probably being optimistic in some places less than that. So in summary, we've discovered that Discovery Deep is deep, definitely down to at least 1400 meters. Whether we've got to the deepest point, who knows? My guess is it probably gets a bit deeper to the north and west, but we're probably not far from the deepest point. It looks like it's gradually rising the bathymetry along to the east, but obviously we don't really know what's happening off the profile to the west, so we don't have an idea of the nature of Discovery Deep. Does it go gently down on one side and back up on the other? Is it flat at the bottom? Is it much steeper on one side? What kind of shape it is, how symmetrical it is, and so on. We can see that the sediments down there, but they're probably quite old, old enough to be quite deformed. Um, we've shown the streamers potentially a more efficient way to collect lots of data. So in summary, we've learned a lot, but there's probably still quite a lot more to learn. Thank you. Oh, that's awesome, Jenny. Thanks so much for sharing that. It's a really exciting discovery, um, no pun intended. Um, any, any questions from anybody in the, in the crowd or online? I'm quite interested to know, um, you know, if you've got plans for using the, the kind of traditional acquisition system alongside the, the streamer or, you know, did you, did you prove something to the, to yourself, to the team that the, the streamer is, um, useful in in particular settings, uh, you know, will you use it again, those kinds of things? I think it would definitely be worth considering using it again, just because you could essentially collect three times as much data in the same amount of time, which has got to be useful. Whether you'd need, and I guess there's another option or two other options. It's not just having everything on the surface or everything buried. You could potentially have the geophones on the surface and your shots buried or your shots on the surface and your geophones buried. And we did one shot of each of those as well that Will's going to be looking at to see how things are. I slightly wonder if burying the geophones but having the shots on the surface might be a good compromise between getting good data quality with stuff buried but not having the hot water drill and all that paraphernalia along with it. But hopefully that's something Will will find out over the next year. Awesome. Oh, cool. Thanks so much for sharing. Thanks. So next up, uh, we'll pop back to Scott Base, uh, or to the area anyways, and we'll, we'll head on with Marin. Again, uh, we're, we're front loading heavy with uh, GNS. Uh, so the last representative from GNS tonight. Thanks. <laughs> Documents. That's right. <laughs> okay, so I wasn't too sure about how to, um, how to, where to go with this presentation. I didn't really want to give a step-by-step -step account of <laughs> what I did. So I'm going to give an overview of the old observatory, um, why we need to move it, um, why we should keep measuring the geomagnetic field at Scott Base, and then introduce the new observatory. Um, for those familiar with the area, um, this is a view from Crater Hill. It's about a 30, 40 minute walk from Scott Base. Um, and arrival heights. <laughs> Arrival Heights is about here. That's where the new observatory is. Um, just quickly, so most of my time at GNS has been work, uh, spent working on the um, GeoNet network, uh, which means I have to be 
a jack of all trades and a master of none, which for me normally means that I know enough to get myself into trouble and do in a lot of things. Um, hopefully enough to get myself out of trouble too, though. Um, and most recently, for about a year, I've been working um, in the GMA team, and a big part of me taking up that work was for the opportunity to get down to Antarctica, because I've always wanted to do that. So this was great. Um, so it was my first time, so here's a quick slide just um, because. Um, so I spent two weeks in Methven, um, which wasn't as bad as I thought. I could swim in the pool with unicorns, set up a geomag observatory in my room. Um, oh, you're not sharing screen, sorry. Oh, okay. This one here should work. How's yeah. that? Cool. Oh. Sorry. <laughs> um, so, yeah, and this is a picture of a, a 30 ton digger back of the C 17. Um, and I was fortunate enough to be able to do uh, field training. And here's the mandatory photo of me um, getting onto the ice for the first time. So why do we care about the magnetic field? Um, so there are two constituents to the magnetic field. Um, it's the slow changes which originate in the core. Um, and so as you can see, this is the magnetic south pole from 1903, 52, 2000 and today. And then the short term record is dominated by space weather. Um, so we can measure the magnetic field uh, from satellites now, but um, we still need ground observatories to, to ground truth these measurements. Um, so detection of solar storms, um, this is important because um, or for a number of reasons. Um, so a change of magnetic field induces a change of current, which can cause havoc in large electrical grids, um, damage to satellites, um, disruption to GPS, so on and so forth. So we can pick up um, magnetic storms um, with a little sudden storm commencement event. So it's like a little blip and then um, followed 40 minutes or so later by uh, the actual storm itself. Kind of like a P wave before an S wave in the photograph. Uh, so the geomagnetic measurements at Scott Base are historically quite significant. Um, so the huts date back to 1958. Um, so they were uh, some of the first buildings at Scott Base. Um, this building here is the Variometer Hut. Um, so it contains the continuously recording um, instruments, which measure the north component, east component, and vertical component, X, Y, Z, and um, total force every second. Um, these magnetograms used to be recorded on uh, photographic paper, so the sign's still on the door. Um, still uh, relevant because we don't want people entering the building um, because they'll, they wear watches and phones and things and they can contaminate the record. Um, and then there's weekly observations undertaken in the Absolutes hut. And I'll talk a bit more about Absolutes um, later on. So as we all know, there's going to be a flash new base built, Scott Base. Um, this is not good for our geomag record, though, because these huts will contain a lot of steel and magnets and introduce a lot of electrical noise because they'll be um, too close to our existing huts. So the long term record is very important. So it's why it's important that we continue measuring um, the field uh, at Scott Base. Uh, in general, there's a lack of Southern Hemisphere observatories, and I guess more importantly, polar regions are quite important due to the strong influence of solar wind on the magnetosphere. And that's why we see a lot of auroras in this area. 
So previously, a couple of colleagues went down um, and did a couple of walk-in surveys with uh, proton magnetometers. So um, similar to this, uh, it's basically two proton magnetometers separated by a meter or so vertically and with a little GPS on top. Um, and uh, they did, a, I think, a 10 meter walking grid um, over a wide area and then honed in on this area here. Um, and the criteria for a good site is a homogeneous field and a low vertical gradient. So it was decided that the variometer hut would be built here and the absolute hut here. And that's about a 15 to 20 meter distance apart. So the huts are elevated on piles for a couple of reasons. Um, firstly, to allow snow to drift underneath. Um, and secondly, because these rocks are felsic and, um, sorry, mafic and highly magnetic, um, we want to keep the instruments as far away from them as possible. Uh, one of the joys of working in Antarctica is that we don't need to use concrete because we can just freeze things into place. Um, it's probably a good place to point out that this was a joint partnership between Antarctica New Zealand and GNS. So Antarctica New Zealand was responsible for basically getting the buildings built um, and putting them in place. And then GNS had input into the design um, and then installing the instruments. So these huts were built in Cromwell um, from non-magnetic material, uh, which seems like a pretty simple criteria, but it's amazing how many how much stuff contains magnetic material these days. So that was a big challenge. Um, and the instruments are placed on three fiberglass piers. So basically fiberglass pipe, um, really solid pipe. And these were iced two and a half meters into the ground. So you can see here, the piers. So this is aluminium um, pier protection around them because this is a really high wind environment and we don't want any projectiles smashing into our fancy new piers. So this is the variometer hut. Um, so it contains the flux gate magnetometer, which is the main instrument. It's a bit like R2D2 here. Um, so that measures XYZ every second and from that we can um, calculate the total force um, but we also have the overhouse of magnetometer as a bit of a quality control so if if these start varying the, the total force measured from flux gate varies a lot compared to the flux uh, proton then we know we have an issue uh, the hut also contains all the electrical equipment and the communications um, so all the data is sent out by fiber and then satellite link back to New Zealand. Um, so the flux gate measures the field to an unknown baseline. Um, and this baseline drifts over time. So that's why we need the absolutes hut. And this is visited once a week. Uh, contains a declination inclination magnetometer, uh, which is basically a theodolite with a flux gate magnetometer carefully aligned. Uh, so every week the observer will align the theodolite perpendicular to the inclination and declination um, and then measure the total force um, with this proton here. Uh, so it's really important because as the name suggests, absolute hut, so absolute record, it's got to be totally magnetically clean um, because this is these are the baselines that we correct the continuously recording flux gate uh, measurements to. So it's quite easy to measure inclination because this is just measured in respect to gravity. Declination is a little bit more difficult because we need to know uh, a known um, azimuth. So at arrival heights, we have two reference marks. This is the primary reference mark, um, and that's viewed 
every week through this little peephole. Um, and we have the secondary reference mark, and that's just a, a lens mark. Um, and if we needed to use that, say something happened to the primary reference mark, um, would have to erect a target over the lens um, survey mark and um, use that instead. We also want to take yearly absolute measurements over the lens mark, the secondary reference mark, um, and that's just to see if anything has changed within the absolute part. So a big part of my fieldwork was actually establishing a reference azimuth. Um, it was particularly difficult um, working with a theodolite um, with um, bulky gloves. Um, and you can only really work for about five minutes without gloves before you start to lose feeling, feelings in your hand. Uh, so to, to work out the azimuths, we used GPS on three survey points, um, the secondary reference mark, um, and two fiberglass matine bars uh, either side of the huts. And we could also use the observation hill cross, uh, which was visible from the uh, new observatory. Uh, so we'd typically occupy these points for a couple of hours, um, and then we'd erect um, targets um, over the, the survey points, and then measure the angle with the theodolite. And um, with these two methods, you can compare the angles calculated from the GPS and measured from the theodolite, and would typically get um, good agreement to within less than half a minute, so uh, less than about 0 0.01 degrees. So this is just a screen grab uh, of the old observatory um, magnetograph and the new observatory magnetograph. And they look pretty similar, so I can only imagine that's a good thing. <laughs> Um, and then finally, sorry, I couldn't really think of a clever segue from doing magnetic cuts to penguins, but I was down there during a, a nice breakout. And um, so I think I was pretty lucky because um, the wildlife was pretty spectacular. So yeah, I'll just leave it there. Okay. Yep. Um, does land movement like matter to the reference point? Uh, yeah, I think we, um, I don't think it's significant around there. Um, yeah, we probably just assume that, that it's static. And, and was there, like, I don't know, the this is the right year for information, but what, was there a magnetic storm down there after the summer that like wiped out the internet or something for a day? Um, during March or? During like just the season, summer season gone. Uh, I know the internet did go down for a bit. But... Yeah. Yes, but that was uh, where we were. I remember somebody saying that the internet got wiped out. It's got based for like a, a day or something. Yeah, when I was down there, it was down for about oh, a few hours, but I'm not sure what the reason was. Right. It could have been a geomagnetic storm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah we'll just say it is. I was going to ask for a standout moment for you, but you kind of beat me to it. Any, anything else jump out of you as a, as a first timer? Is there anything you had to um, well, really? We managed to see some pretty cool whales, so oh, minke cool. whales and yeah. Arno beak whales, which apparently are really rare. Right, right. So probably just the wildlife. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. And all the um, walks and stuff that you can do from, from the base. Yeah. Thanks, yeah. Cool. Thanks Thank so you. much. Right, so it's been very terrestrial so far. We'll, uh, we'll take us out to sea. Um, we're lucky enough to have 
uh, Anna with us from the Navy to give us a rundown of how the maiden voyage on the Aotearoa went. Let's see if I can do my duties as How are we looking? All right, off to you, Anna. Thanks. Thank you. <laughs> hey, I'm Anna Bergen, and I'm a Lieutenant in the Royal New Zealand Navy, and thank you very much for inviting me here to speak tonight. Um, I've come to talk to you guys about the Navy's newest and biggest ship, HNNZS Aotearoa, and a recent deployment to resupply Scott Base and McMurdo Station. Taking a ship to that incredible part of the world is simply the greatest adventure of them all. A couple of weeks prior to setting sail for Antarctica, the Tongan volcano and tsunami uh, occurred. And I mention this because for Aotearoa and her crew, what was meant to be two weeks of final preparations for our first trip to one of the most dangerous parts of the world got squeezed into 24 hours, as well as embarking rations and supplies and equipment for disaster relief we deployed to Tonga. What I find still quite humorous is that we were issued our extreme weather, cold weather clothing while working in 30 degree plus heat in the tropics. I'll start with a clip that depicts our deployment really well. Thank you. 
So Aotearoa is New Zealand's newest and biggest ship, commissioned in July 2020. She is a fuel tanker, with her primary role being to provide fuel to ships whilst at sea, as you saw her do with the US Navy ship Samson, who also came to provide aid to Tonga. It means ships can remain at sea longer for long periods and do not have to waste time looking for a friendly port to resupply. Aotearoa can carry 8,000 tonnes of diesel fuel and 1.5 thousand tonnes of aviation fuel. She can carry 22 20 foot containers. Fastest speed is 20 knots, which is about 37 kilometres an hour. And she has two sea boats and a helicopter embarked. As you saw in the video, she can produce 100,000 litres of pristine fresh water every day, even when in shallow silty harbours. We have 69 core crew and we can embark another 30 people, be they trainees, scientists, or even uh, the governor general herself. She was custom designed to fill capabilities required by New Zealand. We needed a ship that was capable of operating around the world, and that included New Zealand's Ross Sea dependency, and be able to resupply Scott Base and McMurdo Station during the summer season. And I'm sure you all know, however, that even in the summer season, the Ross Sea can be rather icy. To be able to navigate in this area of the world, a ship must be built to uh, the polar class standards. Aotearoa is polar class six, meaning she can operate throughout the summer and autumn season in medium first year ice, which may include old ice inclusions. What does that mean? <laughs> she is not an icebreaker, but she has a specially designed bow, ice strengthened underwater appendages and a strengthened section around her hull, which is called the ice belt, allowing her to proceed through pack ice up to 70 centimetres thick and in concentrations up to four tenths. What does that mean? This way she is more pushing the ice out of her way rather than breaking her way through it. If she wants to get through anything more than this, she can safely follow an icebreaker. And the winterization features ensure all her upper deck equipment and machinery, including life-saving equipment, remain fully functional in the extreme cold. So what was the purpose of Aotearoa's deployment to Antarctica earlier this year? As a brand new ship, our primary mission was to prove she is capable of what she has been built to do and of what the government requires from her and that the people are capable of doing it. For example, upper deck machinery is going to suffer some extreme cold and we still need it to work even when iced over. The main crane needs to work so we can offload the containers at McMurdo Station. The small boats need to be able to be launched in order to deploy scientific experiments or to recover someone who's fallen overboard. A life raft need to operate correctly in case the worst happens. Air intakes need to be free from ice, the heated walkways and rail, handrails not only provide a safe passage but help reduce ice accretion, the buildup of ice on the higher surfaces, which can interfere with the centre of gravity and put the ship at risk of capsizing. All this needs to be designed perfectly and operating well for a safe passage to Antarctica. Her required capabilities include transferring liquid cargo and bulk stores to the continent. We embarked cold climate aviation fuel and on our way south from Tonga, we stopped in Middleton where we embarked 10 containers for Antarctica, New Zealand. Taking a ship to Antarctica is not your ordinary run of the mill cruise at least not for those of us who are responsible for driving it and keeping it safe. We amended our usual routines on the bridge to mitigate against fatigue the fatiguing nature of the extended daylight hours and the extra intensity required keeping a continuous lookout for boogie bits or growlers, pieces of ice that float just below the surface of the water um, but can be the size of a car and rip right through a hull if you're at speed. Every day, the weather forecast was scrutinized, as was the ice forecast, displaying where the edge of the ice was expected to be. We divided our progress into stages, marked by little, cue, little clues you pass each latitude line. We monitored our progress against uh, the forecast weather systems that rip around the continent about every seven or so days. After lingering north for a weather system to pass through, we gunned it south as quickly as possible to get through the roaring 40s, the furious 50s and the screaming 60s before the next weather system bowled on through. 
We timed it perfectly, but there was still three days of rough. After the sea state, the birds are your next indicator of how far south you are. The albatross accompany you until about 50 or 60 degrees south. Then there's no birds at all for a stretch till you see the snow petrel. Pure white petrels and you know you must be getting close to the icebergs. And sure enough, we saw it, our first iceberg. Everyone takes a photo of the first iceberg. The magnitude of these giants, their shapes and colors are so varied. Everything about them is awe-inspiring. Drifting about the vast ocean, slowly getting further and further from the continent, slowly being eaten away by the warm water but they do make for some dangerous navigation in the meantime. In this next clip, I would like to introduce you to the commanding officer, Captain Simon Griffiths. Specifically designed for operating in Antarctica, but also for operating in ice. And we've tested it here, pushing through pack ice. It's an incredible experience. You nudge your way in, you put on the power, and you push your way through the ice. It scrapes at the back, it bangs its way down the side. But the ship is capable, it's proven the versatility of the ship. It's able to operate from the tropics right down into the depths of Antarctica. Uh, we've been able to prove that we can navigate it. We've been able to support science projects. And most importantly, we've proved that we can get the ship here to the ice pier of the Faro Station. Uh, we can offload the containers that we've brought for Antarctica New Zealand down to New Zealand that has their stores and all the equipment they need. We can also transfer fuel into this installation here at the Faro Station. And most importantly, I guess it proves that the Royal New Zealand Navy once again has a maritime capability that can help support our national program here in Antarctica. Our Navy travels far and wide, does a lot of amazing things around New Zealand in the Pacific and, and much further afield. But it's when you head south and you get into Antarctic waters, it, it really is different. Uh, the winds and the wind chill is phenomenal. Everything freezes down here. Uh, we're navigating around icebergs, we're navigating through pack ice. It is stunningly beautiful, it is a magical place, but it is also wild, dangerous. If we don't treat it with respect, it can put some punches in the nose. First time in 50 years that a New Zealand Navy ship has been part of a recent flight mission to Antarctica, and it's the first time that a New Zealand Navy ship has birthed here at the ice pier at Edo Station. Aotearoa is an amazing ship, but it's the people on board that make it work. It's the people on board that have got us from the tropics in Hubbard to Tonga to here in the freezing cold of Antarctica. Uh, it is a team effort and we're incredibly proud of what we do on the ship, proud of what we're doing for our Navy, but most of all, we're incredibly proud of what we do and what we represent for New Zealand. So you saw them conducting some experiments along the way. This is a remote part of the world. So the data we have from this area is lacking to say the least. Uh, this is the likes of wave and meteorological and climate data. This is the data that formulates our weather and ice forecasts. And if there are no humans or robots in the area collecting it, we have nothing much but satellite imagery to hypothesize from. So another of our main objectives was to conduct a number of scientific experiments at various latitudes and in different types of ice. We tested a new ice radar, we launched weather balloons and released a wave boys, conducted bathymetry drops. We took air samples to be brought back to New Zealand for analyzing. What I quite liked was that on the passage south, we deployed uh, wave boys and the data that was being received from these wave boys, uh, we were able to use on our way north. There's a bathymetry drop there. Now, the moment us seafarers were all waiting for, the crew were fortunate enough to be able to step ashore on Ross Island and visit McMurdo Station in Scott Bass. After berthing at the ice pier, also a wicked piece of engineering, 
we offloaded the containers for Antarctic New Zealand and embarked on embarked all the returning containers, no doubt full of waste, and commenced the fuel transfer. We pumped through the night. The fueling party, of course, enjoyed constant daylight. Once the valves were shut and hoses disconnected, leave was piped, and it was time to get off the ship and go exploring. I'll remind you, we sailed for Tonga four whole weeks ago. How cool is Antarctica? <laughs> In every sense of the word. Despite being only days prior to the end of the season, the people stationed at McMurdo were the most gracious hosts. They organized guided tours to Scott Base, Castle Rock, Scott's Hut, the Ice Shelf, science facilities, and even snowmobile rides. We hired gear for snowboarding, mountain biking, hiking. The ship's crew loved their time on the ice. Some even refused to come home at night because of course, there was no night. And what better time to climb Observation Hill than midnight? Some of us even went swimming. I say I went swimming, but I suppose it was better described as a quick dip. Wallowing nearby was a sea lion and two penguins on an icy patch on the beach, Mount Erebus in the distance. It wasn't even on my bucket list, but I might as well as add it now, seeing as I've done it. I am an officer of the watch in the Navy and I drive ships, driving my ship along the edge of the Ross ice shelf and towering 50 meters high through pack ice and around icebergs was one of the coolest things I've ever done. It was really the greatest adventure of them all. I'd like to remind you, she's not just the Navy ship, she's your ship, and I'm sure you guys will see a lot more of her in the next, uh, next few years heading down to the ice. Thank you very much. That's incredible. Oh, thanks so much for sharing. Anybody have any questions for Anna? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, this might be a little bit sensitive, but... You, you're truly not relying upon like site for icebergs. I would have thought that you'd like have a kit to like identify um, identifiable <laughs> things in the ocean around you. Um, so other things that we're using uh, the radars. The radars were surprisingly good, um, and and even the ship's fitted radar. The new radar was was not bad either. Um, yeah, the radars are really good, but. I spoke about collecting data for the forecast. The forecasting of the ice edge is really poor at the moment, just because you've got to be there to see it. And if there's no one there, there's no one reporting it. Um, and and one, of, one of our, one night, our, we were trying to search for the ice edge. We could see where it was forecast to be. We were already there. I was like, oh, let's come a little bit further and go find it. And then, and then we eventually did find it and I had, Nightmares that night thinking I'd gone and driven the ship into, <laughs> into, into a pack ice. But yeah. So. Um, and I guess, yeah, the New Zealand Navy doesn't have a lot of reason to go into a Not a lot. Not a, I don't think we've been up there in a little while. Yeah. We, do, we do have a couple of ships going around the world shortly, though. By shortly, I mean in a couple of years. <laughs> Thank you. Science operations. So, what do you think is the potential for this? Great potential. So, what what can the Navy provide? Um, the, the scientists, we, we can get you on the ice, we can get you in the water with the small boats. Um, we have space on the ship to set up all your computers and stuff. <laughs> um, 
and um, we've got we've got space to take people as well. We, we I think we've got 30 odd spare pits or beds for um, people. Um, containers, you can, um, I think one idea was to embark a, a containerized lab or whatever, whatever is possible. You can take that down. Um, set up equipment, so um, antennas and what, um, other, other in, um, receivers on the, on the ship as well. So you're saying if, if we've got ideas, come, come up to them too. Most definitely. <laughs> Most and Anna uh, has a, a, a spot um, in our heart for rocks as well. So anybody interested in uh, maybe proposing some rocks, you know, yeah. collecting, we can talk more about that. always put more ballast on the ship. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Amazing. And uh, yeah, it's with, it's with great pride. It's, uh, you know, a member of the Antarctic Society that the, the Aotearoa has joined us as an institute member for the Antarctic Society and Anna has been instrumental in making that happen. So hats off to you and congrats on the, you know, first maiden voyage for yeah. the ship. It's Thank amazing. you. Thank you. Yes. It, was, it was a great success. <laughs> so that concludes our second installment of the of the um, Fresh Off the Ice series. So I really appreciate everyone online. I, I don't, uh, sorry, we've been neglecting you. It, it looks like everybody's uh, happy with, uh, with what we've been up to. So thanks for joining us, everybody. And thanks everybody here. Uh, thanks to the speakers, Graham, Jenny, and Marin, uh, Marin and, and Anna as well. It's a really successful uh, second installment here. So. Uh, yeah, look forward to more events from us. And I think that's about it for the evening. So thanks, everybody. We'll see you, see you later. <laughs>